By 2017, there was a comprehensive innovation pact that was signed between Israel and China. What Israelis are starting to realize since the, the reaction to um, the Hamas attack is that this was actually a, a, a Faustian bargain. This was a dance with the devil. This is a Visegrad 24 series about the Israel-Hamas war. Matt Tiermond here from Visegrad 24 in our continuing series of interviews, podcast style, from Israel, from Tel Aviv, talking to journalists and politicians and military leaders and thought leaders and social media leaders and critics and those who just get involved and get engaged and have interesting stuff to, to say and share. And right now I'm happy to, to be talking to a longtime friend of mine, Melissa Chen, who has a strategy risk consulting firm aptly named Strategy Risks, focusing on decoupling from China and assessing the risks that China presents, especially to businesses, but China presents risks to every sort of cohort. And we'll talk a little bit about that. Among, also, we'll talk about Israel, because we're here and we're here for a reason. We're here because something happened in this region that has worldwide reverberations. Mm -hmm. And I want to hear what you think about it, why you're here, what you think, how you assess it as a strategy risk analyst, as well as China's engagement here as you're an expert. Uh, the, the world in October 7th just was such a different world. And since, you know, that fateful day, it's just, it's been very unsettling. Um, I, I'm sure, uh, you know, globally, the, the, the geopolitical tectonic forces almost just feels completely out of sync. Uh, fast forward, the last time I was here in Israel, I was here on a press trip in 2022 at the end of it. And um, we were invited by the Israeli consulate in New York, a bunch of um, journalist types, you know, heterodox journalists. Um, and when we came, there was a lot of optimism about in the region. Mostly this was the result of the Abraham Accords. Um, the, we visited the offices of certain uh, venture capitalists here. There was a lot of investment in tech. The, the country just seemed to be thriving. Um, and then, of course, you had later on political problems. That was actually, when we came, it was a transition between governments, so they actually didn't have a, a government in place yet. Um, and there was a lot of talk about the incoming government and the potential judicial reforms. And so we kind of knew there was a bit of politics that was gonna make things a bit rocky for, for Israel. Um, but we didn't expect something like that to happen. Certainly Sullivan didn't expect something like that to happen, I think just two weeks before um, Hamas uh, attacked Israel. He said, oh, you know, this region has been very stable um, and very quiet. And, and indeed, um, the world seemed to be much focused on, on China and the upcoming uh, elections in, in Taiwan and how that was gonna change things. But it turns out, well, we, the United States and, and Europe uh, took their eye off the ball in the Middle East for, for a while too. And, and we're, we're kind of like living in the repercussions right now. It just feels very unsettling because we now have conflict in three different theaters. In, in, in Russia, Ukraine, here in the Middle East, and all these alliances that once were are now broken, and, and China is, you know, issues in, in, in Asia also bubbling up with China and Taiwan especially. We were talking offline before we, uh, we started the taping about China being involved directly in Israel. And I think that's, you know, we talk a lot, especially in recent weeks, about the detente that was about to take place with Israel and Saudi Arabia, uh, which would be, that was obviously a threat to Tehran, a, Iran, which was very much directly behind both Hamas's incursion on October 7th, as well as Hezbollah in the north getting kinetic and, and attacking. Uh, Hamas fighters were found with Chinese weapons. Uh, the Saudis are sort of in a different axis of, uh, of influence. Uh, and you were telling me things I didn't know about China's involvement in the economic imperial games they play globally. If they can't you know, go and conquer via uh, you know, kinetic warfare, they do it using their economic cash reserves that they've developed from trade with the West for the last 40, 50 years since Nixon opened up ties. China's involved here. Tell the audience about that. I don't think people realize it. The interesting history of this is that during the period when Mao was in power, uh, China was one of the, actually the biggest funder of the PLO. And in that, in that, in doing that, I think what, you know, 
to, to see this action more of as a statement against Western imperialism, nothing more. Um, but since there were economic reforms, Deng Xiaoping took over, the relationship changed. Um, Israel started courting China, um, especially in areas of economic integration. It made sense, you know, Israel is a small country and small countries are generally price takers, they're not price makers. And so you've got to hedge a little bit. And eventually, I think by 2017, there was this uh, deal that was signed. It was a comprehensive innovation pact that was signed between Israel and China. And there were a lot of cooperation on, on, on many fronts, not just economic, but even, even scientific. Um, and we all know now the kind of like corporate um, uh, strategy that China tends to employ when it gets involved with other countries and other, other uh, companies. There are sensitive um, IP that gets transferred over. And so that did happen here with certain industries like biotech. Uh, the thing that actually is surprising is that the Shanghai International Port Group, SIPG, was allowed to actually take over and run the Haifa port. So you have basic infrastructure in here in Israel. Right now in Tel Aviv, the subway that's being built is also being built by a, a Chinese company. Um, and I think what the what the what Israelis are starting to realize since the, the reaction to um, the Hamas attack is that this was actually a, a, a Faustian bargain. This was a dance with the devil. Uh, and I, I, I hear, you know, been here on the ground talking to some people and, and that there are actually increasing concerns about, about this development. I would hope so. I mean, you see China playing both sides. Of course, Israel, as you said, small country. The force multiplication you get in output, economic value add, the real, the real economic real politique of that, of course you want the access to the Chinese labor market, very cheap labor for the assembly and manufacture of even high-tech goods. We know Apple is so uh, deeply embedded uh, with their supply chain and their, their structure of production uh, in China. Uh, Israel probably will have to take a second look at that with the, these Iranian relations, these weaponry uh, dispersals to terrorists. I didn't know that about the PLO. I, I'd assume that uh, much like the Latin American uh, revolutionary movements, it was funded by the Soviet Union. And China was deeply involved here in that. I don't think people know that. I mm -hmm. think that the people of Israel, knowing that their biggest existential threat is basic level security, and if China's working to undermine that, they would probably say, you know what, we need more protective legislation and regulation on, on dealing with China. Uh, what are some of your, uh, your takeaways from being here and the dynamics of the military, of the war, where things might go, uh, the two-state solution, uh, racial unity, disunity on the ground here? because you're very well-traveled and you've been a critic, uh, and not in a negative way, but an analyst of so many places over the years that I've followed you, that we've been friends. It's, it seems that people are pretty united. I um, was actually surprised to, to see that. Um, of course you have, you know, I, I think it's, I think the, the voices that, that kind of um, constitute um, uh, truly like heterodox opinions. I, I've been following even, you know, Palestinian accounts that are critical of Hamas, for example, but, but still pro-Palestine. Um, and then the kind of hate that they get. What really strikes me about this conflict is, and, and something that I've been trying to like learn and understand, why is it that Israel has been losing the PR war? What is going on there? Um, and the longer this goes, um, the, the, the more likely that public opinion is really you know, going to change. We're already seeing that you know, in, the, in the US and, and, and in the UK and other parts of the West. The thing is that what I've noticed is that if you are pro-Israel in any way or you try to say something nice about the Israelis or you try to point out something about anti-Semitism, you are met with vitriol. You are met with uh, really, really nasty rhetoric that is shocking. Um, but if you are pro-Palestine generally, you can, you can kind of do so under the, the banner of resistance, under the banner of fighting for the oppressed. And so you, you have this asymmetry where one side really has no limiting principle and the other side has um, almost no ability to come out and say anything nice uh, just because of the backlash and the canceling and all that. So it's this is in part the dynamics uh, where it's so hard to be friends with, with you know, I, I have friends, for example, who are Israeli Jews, they, you know, went to Harvard and 
turns out they're their Arab classmates can't even be friends with them on Facebook, you know, because it's not safe for them. So that's the kind of dynamic that we're talking about. In the end, Israel is just going to keep losing this PR war until this asymmetry, until that people are actually able to confront and say, you know what, I don't care about about the consequences. I'm just going to to um, you know speak what I believe. I think October seventh might have been that breaking point. We see obviously, look, there's 14 million or 15 or 16 million Jews in the world, half of them, give or take, are in Israel. The majority of the other half are in the New York area with you know, some spurs in LA and South Florida, uh, some in France, but no critical mass in population. Even if there is a, uh, a large stake in the media complex, in professional trades and network effect, software and hardware and technology, but the sheer numbers of the Arab world and the young people who are willing to join forces in a cause celeb because the Marxists always go to the youth. They always say, you know, they, they, it was an economics issue, then it was a racial issue, now it's an intersectional and colonial oppressor issue. Uh, somebody who was sitting right here actually the other day that I interviewed, Ari Lightstone, he told me something and I didn't know it at the time. He said that his daughter said something the day after it happened. I thought she was a college student, it turned out she was 12. And she came downstairs after, you know, watching some coverage of everything that transpired and said, how do people not have the obvious common sense of basic moral clarity? Those who rape, behead, kill, blow up, explode, blow themselves up uh, to kill 50 people in a town square versus those who drop leaflets, those who come up with innovative life-saving technology and share it with the world, et cetera, et cetera. How do people not see this? And she was totally befuddled. She came back the next morning and said, I get it now. It's the same people that say men can get pregnant, uh, women have penises, and uh, men can breastfeed, it's the same people who are saying the same things. So it's not just moral clarity, it's basic clarity on the basic fundamental issues of humanity. And that's yeah. why they go to these people. Yeah. So, you know, you're a big part, you're a media analyst as well. I mean, you've done more podcasting and discussion and writing about the media complex, the ivory tower complex. Does it come to a breaking point because it's so ridiculous? I think, the, I hope the Harvard you know, when, when you had that testimony um, that led to the downfall of Claudine, Claudine Gay, Gay. Um, the president of Harvard, I, I hope that is the breaking point because it seems like the billionaire class has woken up. Um, That's true. The pen board. Right. Yeah. And, and, you know, there's a lot of restructuring going on, a lot of people saying, what have we created and done? And, you know, part of my reaction was, why did, why did it take this conflict? You know, did you not see what was going on? Were you blind to what was going on for the last seven, eight years? Um, with the free speech culture being eroded, you know, speakers are being canceled. And at some point, UC Berkeley was on fire, you know, just because of speakers coming in. And none of that was cause for concern. None of the racialized curriculum was, was a cause for concern. But, but, you know, when it became so obvious, the basic moral bar to clear was condemn Hamas, con condemn what happened. Couldn't and do it. They couldn't do it. They, 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 they had to both sides a conflict especially if you look at the reaction to just after October 7th, before Israel even responded, um, the idea that you know, Jewish students on campus uh, had to tolerate being yelled at about ethnic cleansing or, or genocide, you know, and you really get the sense of, we said never again, but did we really? Not only could they not do it, condemn Hamas, they condemned those who could do it. So the derivative, is even, it's like a, a, a funnel, is even more gross. Yeah, And exactly. to find in congressional hearings, the president of Harvard, just much like Yale, Columbia, Penn, a place, and you've done more work than anybody on this in the public debate on free speech, they have speech codes. Everything is speech is violence, hate speech, and then they defended free speech for the first time yep. publicly in decades. Ex at least since Vietnam. Yeah, yeah. and at ex-University Chicago, my alma mater, who is relatively better on it, relatively. Yeah. People actually think it's way better than it is. I can tell stories about that, but that's not the time. Uh, it was really ironic yeah. to see that. So there has to be more bloodletting of the university admin and tenured professorial class. Yeah, and don't forget the social media platforms. I think a lot of the anti-Semitic content is thriving on TikTok, and that's where the, the youth are. And so you look at long-term polling, um, it does not bode well in terms of what Israel is up against globally in terms of optics. How did Osama bin Laden's letter get this traction? If, I mean, you do serious 
you know, risk analysis and strategic analysis. Do you have any like infographics of where it started, where it accelerated? Was it on TikTok? Was it on Twitter? It was on TikTok. Um, you know, there there is almost nothing that really uh, gets swept up on TikTok that is not it it, it is not directly um, something that can be throttled directly. You know, by by the party, and. Um, Things are allowed to thrive, or things are allowed to be shut down. Um, you know, in much the same way. Look, uh, the U.S. is no saint either. We have discovered, obviously, through the Twitter files, that governments have always had this kind of tension with social media companies because it's it's completely ungated speech, right? And so, it's it's a very similar dynamic. And and you know, with this is something that's actually quite new. Uh, usually, anti-Semitic content, besides coming from in Middle Eastern accounts, were, were inflamed by, by Russia. Yeah. But now, China's gotten into the game, and that's been actually very clear since the uh, October 7th conflict. China's stance is also publicly, in terms of uh, condemning I Israel, has really taken a, a whole, has gone up a, a whole different level. They used to be kind of a bit more passive, uh, very very much you know, saying things like, oh, well, we, we demand a ceasefire, we lament the uh, slow peace process that's not yielding any results. But now China has taken that a, a step, um, a, a, a whole step up and actually condemning actually the United States for even supporting an, a regime like Israel. And you know, the, the rhetoric has just like gone up one, one level. What's the motive for that? We know with Russia, the motive, especially in the here and now, is divert U.S. Uh, attention and military capacity to this region away from Ukraine. But what's the Chinese motive, just being on the other side of the United States? It is being, it, you know, I think it is about positioning itself against the United States and its allies. Um, but in part, it's also trying to um, accrue some sort of social and political status with Arab leaders around the region. I think China did try to broker a deal between Iran and Saudi Arabia. Um, so they like to play this public role of we're actually neutral. We, we want to be friends with everybody um, and, and be seen as a serious Fair international player. player. So Duganism's uh, uh, systematic uh, paradigm he's trying to introduce into the world, which is multipolarity, exactly. the three great powers, US, Russia, and China, of course, he's biased toward Russia, even though they really should have no standing in the world based on any metric, economic might, outputs, and innovation. China has, you know, it should be maybe India uh, in, in that. So it's, it's the view that, okay, now I'm gonna be an arbiter of diplomacy. I'll be, Correct. you know, the Congress of Vienna will now be held the Congress of Shanghai, yep. and even though they're malefactors. But ironically, they're also using, you know, the West's idea of, wait, but you guys said diversity strength. We're asking for a diverse world order and that you should make it fair and let other players play in this international arena. So they're actually kind of using the diversity uh, argument in, in, in geopolitics, which I find funny. TikTok, I know you're a critic. Ironically, the one thing that the cabinet uh, the level... Senate confirmed appointees of both the Trump administration and the Biden administration, uh, Ajit Pai and Brendan Carr, the FCC heads, they both agree TikTok should be banned. What do you think? I, I, I do think so too. Um, the resistance to it seems to be coming from um, US investors being on the board of ByteDance and having a stake and they're probably being, you know, they're able to lobby the government. Um, and, and I think in the US we're always very careful about Okay, what precedent is this set? Sure. Um, On an FTC issue, look, trade issue. This, yeah. Remember what happened to Grindr, where um, there were security breaches, and a sale was actually forced. Uh, I think it was. Yeah. I actually don't remember what happened with Grindr, but maybe I just don't follow Grindr much. Oh uh, well. <laughs> uh, yeah. No. There's certainly you know with big tech being now the third leg of the ivory tower that can uh, coerce society. The, the, the academy, the media, and big tech, and all of them working in conjunction with one another. Correct. TikTok seems to be, yeah, TikTok seems to be at the center of the narratives perpetuated by all big three. Uh, can it be banned in the US, the EU? I mean, I, I don't know the answer. I mean, this is really a question of political will. Yeah. Um, I see no reason why we cannot do, uh, at least force the sale to a US company. Sure. We have Would done that, that before. Really, it is about 
um, monitoring the traffic, where servers, where information is being stored, what, you know, China does not have the same kind of separation of church and state uh, between the government and, and the and corporations. They are one and the same. Ask Jack uh, so Ma. That's, exactly. So that's a very different. One more question. Qatar, Al Jazeera, any thoughts there? Well, we know that uh, Qatar is also funding a lot of uh, institutions of um, higher education in the U.S. Um, like China has been involved in subverting a lot of American institutions and also media narratives. Um, but it is much smaller in terms of its um, just pure dollar amounts in, in universities and the way they kind of play the game is a little is, is different. Well, right now, the last study I saw that's gotten some press is the last couple of years, uh, Qatar is three and a half billion dollars, three X what China's put in to professorships and fellowships. Now that might be a outlying time period because of the post-COVID period. Right, right. Uh, but I mean, it is pretty interesting. 3X, huh? 3X, 3 x 3.4, 3.5 billion dollars for professorships and fellowships. China's at like 1.2. But again, I, you know, I would want to see a longer term uh, smoothing uh, moving average. But professorships only one area in which China is able to influence higher education. They also have different kinds of partnerships, satellite campuses in China. Mm, they also have, you know, have um, things like Thousand Talents programs and, yeah. and other other ways Fusion of influencing. Institutes. Exactly. And, yeah. yeah. Well, Melissa, I know we could go on for hours. Unfortunately, I don't have the clout that Joe Rogan has. My producer's glaring at me. So I don't get hours. I only get a few amazing minutes with you. And I Always always that? love talking to you, whether it's Afghanistan a couple years ago or yeah. this conversation we're having now. <laughs>